All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Mike Pagan, who is in Warwickshire in the UK. How are you doing, Mike? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for having me uh, today, John. Looking forward to this. Yeah, absolutely. And Mike is a superior executive coach with more than 25 years combined corporate business management coaching and consulting experience. And Mike has uh, just released this book called Mental Wealth, Unlock Your Potential and Enrich Your Life, which is something that uh, we're going to talk about today. Uh, so, Mike, first of all, um, what was the genesis of this book and, and why did you feel you needed to write it? OK, well, the simplicity of it is uh, mental wealth is clearly a play on the phrase mental health. Um, and just just from the off, I am not a mental health expert. There are thousands of people across the world who are brilliant in this area, and it's an area that needs so much more addressing. But my focus is on mental wealth, which is about having the right support network around you, that, that proactive team, people that have truly got your back. Um, the supporting you, asking better questions of you, challenging you and making you accountable and hold, helping you through the good times and the bad times. Because, because the, the biggest challenge I, I believe we have is, is isolation. Uh, isolation kills creativity and prevents decision making. And as a result of that happening, that can then have a detrimental effect on our mental health as we spiral into uh, procrastination and issues like that where we're not making things happening. And then that just uh, gets into our mental health because every, everybody is on a mental health spectrum. We can wake up on a Tuesday <laughs> feeling awesome and then on a Wednesday for no apparent reason whatsoever, uh, the whole world's falling apart. So we're all on a spectrum that, that varies from one day to the next. And it's having that the, the, the active people challenging, questioning. Uh, I, know, I know in, in the world of sales, questioning is so important. If mm -hmm. we ask better questions of the people that we're talking to, then the chances are we've got more probability of getting better answers. Yeah, it, it's really it's really fascinating, Mike. And obviously, the pandemic has brought this into sharp focus because mm. uh, isolation is probably one of the one of the big things that has impacted a lot of people. You know, depending on on where you live, and and maybe a lot of people working virtually for the first time, so they don't have you know surrounded by their they're not in their usual surroundings or the the people around them. And I think people well, have there's a reason, John, why they put yeah. they have isolation for prisoners in prisons. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. a punishment. Uh, it, it's 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 depriving us from our uh, peer support and our um, uh, va va voom, our sort of just enjoyment and life and energy. And when you put in that environment as through the, through the pandemics and ice uh, and everything that's gone on through lockdowns, it's it's been tough and continues to be tough for, for many people around the world. Yeah, and and I think one of the things, Mike, and I get interested to get your perspective on this is I, I think we also uh, live in a work culture generally nowadays, you know, Western work culture where we feel like we're supposed to know everything. We feel like we're supposed to be able to, uh, you know, solve every issue and, and reaching out mm -hmm. for help or saying that. I don't know, what, or I'm struggling, or I don't know what I'm doing is kind of anathema. But that's where you really start to impact your your mental health, right? Oh, totally. And, and and my my history here is I've had the privilege of working with professional and elite sportsmen and women as they transition from their professional career in sport to life after sport. And uh, the guillotine comes down in that world. And they had 35 people keeping them on the track in the pool or on the pitch yesterday. And today or tomorrow. None of those people are fit for purpose in their support network going forward. So this is where they really get hit by isolation. And it's that transition space where we all transition at different points through our lives, whether it be from, from school and college into university to becoming a homeowner, to becoming a, a, a part of a couple, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And right to the point of when we're uh, working out our succession planning and our retirement and what you do. All throughout that journey, we're transitioning. So this support network has to evolve and we have to say goodbye to people who are no longer helping and focus on the people that are really going to help us through the next stage so that the mistakes we make and we will still make mistakes but we can bounce back more effectively from them uh, and the crisis that happens around them isn't necessarily as long term or as deeply felt as it has been in the past. Yeah, and 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 it's fascinating what you say there Mike because yeah we're we're in transition all the time 
but at the same time, we kind of have this strange, uh, strange drive to try and control things, to try and keep things the same, to try and evolve maybe or transition very slowly. And to your point, maybe we carry people, we carry ideas or circumstances uh, a lot longer than we should through that transition. And that can cause its own issues. Yeah. And, and what, what I focus in on is building a, a mental wealth team. Uh, and so, so, but initially to do that, we have to take a sort of a, a baseline position. Who's in our team now? And so what I would challenge people watching and listening to this is just write down a list of all the names of people you think have got your back, have got your support, and then score them on a level of one to 10, one being a low score, 10 being a high score, as to how committed are they to you, really? Now, this is totally subjective. Don't think about giving people bigger scores just because you think their ego might get upset or whatever it is. No, be honest. And what you'll find is the one, twos and threes are acquaintances. They know your name. Yeah, uh, they, they, you might have said yes to a friendship request on LinkedIn, but you don't actually know them. Your fours and fives. Now, these are people that you might play sport with, you're involved with through, through children, whatever it is. Uh, but if you don't turn up for a couple of months because you've had a shoulder injury, they're not going to ring you. Um, but when you come back, they'll be so happy to see you again, but they're not involved in your life. Then, then you've got your sixes and sevens. Now, these people can be your best mates. They can be uh, people you go to birthdays, weddings. Uh, you play sport with them regularly. Uh, you, but the one thing you don't do is we don't have intimate, detail, uh, personal, uh, insightful conversations with them about finance, about holidays, about life, about direction. Uh, these are people that... Uh, you, you have a great time with, but they're not your inner sanctum. They're not your wealth team. And it, the, the only people that count in men, the mental wealth team is those that score eight, nines and tens. Uh, the rest of them are, are great, but they're not they're not the inner sanctum. And the point is, and for some people, you might only have two names there that, that score. Um, and for others, you might have far too many names there because you've you've overinflated the numbers. But that's OK. We could we can do that. But then it's, it's working out, all right, where am I going to go to to get these right people for me going forward so I've got the support for the longer term? And that, that's, yeah. that's where I, I help people build these teams. Yeah, and, and what's fascinating about that is, uh, is, Mike, I think that's a huge struggle sometimes for people because, I mean, we live in this strange world today, especially – uh, with social media and all of that, where, you know, popularity, followers, all of that, uh, you know, things have gotten skewed a little bit and people and then and people judge everything by numbers instead of quality. But to your point is, if you really examine, I always use the thing, I always use the the one of uh, if I broke down on the freeway at 4 a.m. in the morning here and I called some uh, who could I call that I know would actually get out of bed and come and find me. Yeah. And and. Frighteningly, you just scroll through all that social media and say, nah, 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 nah. <laughs> really, and, and that, that's the part of it, because we are driven by this uh, uh, fear of missing out, all the other uh, elements that go with. And it's really understanding those people, because for me, I, I talk about the four areas where they come from, self-care, uh, coaching, the professional team, and then I talk about masterminding and peer support groups, because within that community, you, you really are opening up and empowering people to help you. And the, I mean, the first one, self-care. This is all about making yourself number one. Now, I, many people in the world of well-being and self-care will talk about that. But for me, I've always been number six in my own head, in my family. A wife, three kids and a dog, <laughs> and yep. then me. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but the reality attached to that is if I'm not able, if, or I'm not fit for purpose, I'm not firing, then how can I help the rest of my family? Uh, and so I do weird things. I, I get accused of being a weekend warrior because I do strange activities. Uh, five years ago now, uh, with a team of others, uh, we were the fastest men's uh, relay team to swim the English Channel, uh, which is kind of, uh, yeah, you, you, you from Ireland, you understand <laughs> that that's cold water, yeah, jellyfish, uh, no sharks, but it's, uh, and big currents. Uh, but, but, but that helped me fall in love with the art of uh, open water swimming, which I now do a lot of for my own mental well-being, my mindfulness, my meditation. And some of the time we need coaches and support that are going to help us in those areas. 
Uh, so that we can focus on our nutrition and the fact that we need to eat more, eat less, drink more, drink less, whatever it is. Uh, we don't have all the answers. And that's where that support network, where they ask better questions, really helps. Yeah, and I, I don't think that's a great point, Mike. And I think that would resonate with a lot of people that they put themselves in, in last place. Because let's face it, I mean, when we have responsibilities, you know, we feel that we put all those responsibilities, all those other people first. But we forget about the fact that unless we are the best version of ourselves, we're not serving them as well as we could either. Yeah. And, and for, for me, the most powerful tool in here is masterminding or peer support groups. And, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be offensive here because the Americans have always claimed that masterminding came from Napoleon Hill and Think and Grow Rich in sort of the early part of the 20th century. But that is not correct. Masterminding actually stems from Birmingham in the UK. Um, and it stems from a society called the Lunar Society that was set up uh, by the likes of Erasmus Darwin and Matthew Bolton during the Industrial Revolution. And because the ideas that these people were coming up with was um, challenging potential religious norms of the day and obviously uh, practices in, in, in industry, they had to meet in secrecy in private under the light of the full moon, hence the Lunar Society. Um, and this is where they were able to have confidential, blunt, direct support and advice, debating all the ideas and options, and then they'd be held accountable by the others for the time they meet the next time, what's going on and how's that working. And that, that format of masterminding and peer support groups is, is so powerful today, where you're on the receiving end in the hot seat, getting challenged about what you're doing personally, professionally and everything else. But then you're on the other side where you're doing the asking and the challenging. And suddenly you're feeling like a hypocrite because you're asking these questions. You're knowing full well, John. Yeah, I'm telling you, you've got to go and do this and, 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 <laughs> and, and be more proactive. But actually, I'm being a lazy what's it and I'm not doing anything myself. Uh, so it's, it's such a powerful tool and it really helps us build members of our mental wealth team. Yeah, and there's an interesting uh, concept you just touched upon there uh, in accountability, because I always think in accountability, whenever you mention that to people, everybody will agree, oh, yes, accountability is really important. But they always mean holding other people accountable. They they rarely uh, start with themselves and, you know, the personal accountability and exactly what you just uh, outlined there is, uh, you know, other people holding you accountable, but you holding people accountable. And then the hypocrisy, if you realize Oh, actually, yeah, I'm holding Mike accountable, but I'm actually not really holding myself accountable for anything. Yeah, for exactly the same thing I'm challenging them on. <laughs> yeah. and, and for me, this, this is the benefits of, of having a, a really powerful mental wealth team. There's, and there's two sides to this. One is for us as individuals and as businessmen and women, uh, whether we be the leaders, the employees, whatever it is, um, we, we are able to have more fun <laughs> because because we know what we're doing. Uh, when my professional support team wasn't fit for purpose at that time. I made some erroneous decisions when it came to property investing and things like that. Then there was this world correction in 2008 and it cost me a lot. Uh, you learn and that's why I have a very powerful support team there uh, that, that, that steps up. But the flip side of this as well though is in the world of mental wealth that feeds into mental health. And regularly when, when you ask somebody that question, are you okay? And you get the response, fine. Now, we all know that's an acronym for something quite different. Uh, but the reality check of that is, we, it's our duty as human beings, as good citizens, to ask better questions. And if you get a response of fine, if you haven't heard from somebody for a period of time, which is unusual, and your gut feel is saying, I really need to have a word, then pick up the phone, send a message, do whatever it is. Because that makes you part of their support team because you're lo looking out for them. You're reaching out for them because you want people to be doing that for you. If the wheels come off in your world, if there's a problem personally, professionally, health wise, whatever it is. So it's our duty as humans to do that for others, because that will really help us manage the, the world of mental wealth and mental health. And, and for yeah. me, one of the driving factors of writing this book was uh, I, I believe it has the power to change lives and the potential to save a life. So with that in mind, it's, it's, it's asking these questions, it's building that support network, because when we're fully supported, we can be awesome more of the time. Not all of the time, 
but more of the time. And that's so important. Yeah, and I think, um, Mike, one of the difficult questions that often people have to ask themselves, as you as you said, when you're build, when you're looking at those who surround you, is uh, you know, do I need as I, do I need to switch out some of these people? But but the problem often is you have to ask yourself, what purpose are these people serving for me? Because yeah. they they're serving some purpose. And even if you say, oh, does this person or they, oh, I knew they would say, I knew they would disapprove of this, or I knew they, you know, they always like make me feel small or whatever it is. You have to ask yourself first is what purpose is that person serving for you? Why are you keeping them here? And, and, and why, why do we want them in our environments? Um, mm-hmm. there's, there's, there's the language of the uh, energy vampires or mood hoovers is the one I use. And these are the people who... No matter what's going on, you've just achieved something brilliant um, and they're sitting in the room. You don't they don't look up. They don't acknowledge you. They don't speak. But automatically you're now feeling anxious and stressed and you were feeling bulletproof before. And now you're feeling vulnerable and uncomfortable. And that that's the power of the mood hoovers. But the, the, the issue we have on mood hoovers, it's not just the others, people around us, be they family, friends or work colleagues or whatever. The biggest mood hoover is the one that lives in between our ears. Uh, and that's where we need the challenge and support of others who are going to turn around and say, John, you know, you said, uh, call me out when I do X. Uh, you're doing X. <laughs> oh, oh, OK, right. Um, it's, and it, But we have to give people permission to do that. They won't do it intuitively or naturally. We have to empower others to look after us. And in turn, we do the same for them. Not necessarily the same person. Uh, because I know there's members of families where um, they'd have you as an 11 out of 10 for you're that important to them. But as far as your mental wealth team, they're only a six. Um, yeah. that, that's, that's just reality. We, we're not it's not a symbiotic relationship always. Yeah, so and exactly. And I think underpinning all of this, Mike, is, you know, the, the choosing the right people for the right, uh, as you said, the right phase of your of your life. And that means examining those who are around you. And as I said, examining why you're keeping them there, because why is that? Why? Why are you keeping that person there um, that makes you feel like that? And as you said, the person inside your head. Um, I yeah. think in the in in psychology today or something, they said somewhere around 70 percent of our thoughts on a daily basis are negative. Our self-talk yeah. rather is negative. It's it's when um, it, 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 you've heard it in the languaging point. Uh, everything that's said be, before the word "but" is irrelevant. Yeah, we're only yeah. going to listen to everything from "but" going forward. Um, now, a, a, a "but" is something that you kick. We know that, but <laughs> it doesn't mean to, it, it, when you're giving feedback to somebody. You as soon as you say the word "but," they they stop the hearing or stop having heard everything prior to that and all they want to listen to now is the negative because i can deal with negative i can't possibly be great i can't possibly be awesome uh, so i'll just listen to the rubbish that either my voice is saying to me or that the other person is that's wrong. Yeah. yeah yeah and i think and i think to your point i think sometimes you have to start um being that being that support for other people to realize that that's what you need in in return uh i mean there's there's some people who who I help out and they have helped me in many ways that they don't even realize, uh, quite yes. frankly. And they're always saying, oh, you know, you do all this stuff for me and I don't do anything. And I say, no, you actually you do. But it, it's sometimes it's complicated to try and articulate the help that you get from other people. Well, it's it, the other part of that, it goes back to that wonderful movie, uh, Pay It Forward, uh, mm-hmm. which you, you, you'll recall. Yeah. Uh, do, do one good deed for three other people and then pay it forward. And, and it's just, that mentality. And I, I was taught that story many years ago when I was a student and I went, I was, I, I was in London and I met up with a, an old school friend of mine who was working in a wine bar. Um, I, I think he was running it actually. And um, at the end of the, of the shift, because it was central London. So they, they finished slightly early. I, I turned around and said, well, that's, that's me spent. I've got no money left. I was a poor student. I'm, I'll, I'm going to head back to my digs and uh, have a pot noodle or whatever it was for dinner. <laughs> Uh, and, he, and he just turned around and said, no, no, mate, we're going out now. Uh, we're going to play and you'll do this for somebody else in the future. Um, and, and so I had to pay it forward and take other people out for drinking sessions and yeah. meals. Oh, well, yeah. What it a sacrifice. Tough. <laughs> it was tough, but, it, 
but it was, it was but that was a genuine first time that pay it forward really uh resonated in me because he just said you'll do it for others and and clearly i did and have and will do again yeah and i and i think that's a and i think that's a great story to be honest mike because i think that's it uh, especially in the world we live in today where it's it's the paradox and there's, there's this massive paradox is right we're 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 very kind of self-absorbed in many ways but at the same time we don't take care of ourselves yeah yeah it's a, and, and and we wait for um a seismic event before we step up and that's that's that back to the self-care we were talking about before and it's uh, it, it's knowing that okay if you continue to do x multiple times a day multiple times that then you will have these problems further down the track uh and mm-hmm. we we just have to do yeah that the, the the ugly line is it's all about discipline and responsibility and taking it but I, a story I, I regularly use here is uh, uh, my my wife lost her mother many years back now, but um, she turned around on on the anniversary. Well, it would have been a, a, a mother's birthday uh, many years after she'd gone, and, and she's there and she said, "I'd just love to get in the time machine and go back and see my mum, age forty, and tell her to give up smoking, because if she gives up smoking, she's got a chance of having a relationship with her grandchildren." And and that was just sort of whoa that that that's heavy but it but it also kickstarted my wife knowing there were certain things in her life where she had potential to um, be jeopardizing her longevity. Let me put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so she changed parts of her nutrition, parts of her health routine, and everything else, knowing full well that she wants to have a relationship with any future grandchildren should and when they come along. It was just yeah. but it was that. It, didn't need a seismic event, It was, but it was a reality check. And what's beautiful about that story, Mike, is that her mother, all these years later, even though she was no longer physically with you, taught her a lesson and, and, oh, yeah. and shared something, which, is, which just shows you, I think, uh, that, that lessons and, and advice can come from surprising places if you're, if you're willing to look out and listen for them. Yes. Yeah. And we, we don't need a medical diagnosis to know that we need to be more active. We need to eat all of these things. Uh, but a lot of people wait for that. And it's that foundation of all behavioral change. And this is sort of whether you're trying to build positive activities in a sales environment, in a, in a working environment or just in parenting or sport or whatever it is. Uh, the foundation of all behavioral change is an emotional connection. And if we mm-hmm. if we get that emotional connection in there, then we're going to do it. If you've got a, a, a coach, mentor or somebody else just telling you what to do, there's no emotional connection. That, that's just teaching or preaching. Uh, you have to find that emotional connection and then we step up. That's what makes the difference. Yeah, listen, fantastic. Great place to finish, Mike. And the book is Mental Wealth, Unlock Your Potential and Enrich Your Life. Uh, All of Mike's information is going to be below this video, links to the book, etc. But before we go, Mike, do tell people briefly what you do and uh, and more about yourself. Thank you very much. I mean, fundamentally, I work with individuals and organizations focusing on building their mental wealth, building their support network. I do that through coaching, through non-exec positions with small businesses, uh, but also plugging people in. Uh, so I, a lot of the coaches that I will plug into organizations uh, are former Olympians and Paralympians who have got brilliant resilience, integrity, uh, stickability stories, uh, and, and they need uh, the challenge and they need the ability to work with individuals and with organizations helping them step up. And you suddenly, you, you bring in somebody who's got a couple of badges and everything else, and they're telling you it's real. It's so powerful. Uh, and then the rest of the time is uh, pulling in peer support groups and public uh, mastermind groups that I run, which again, just gives people that support network, uh, drives them forward, holds them accountable, done in confidence, so that you can actually be truly open and honest. Uh, and priority number one is having fun. Yeah. Yeah. And I think if there's one thing that the, the world today is teaching us that, that so you've been through the pandemic, we're seeing what's happening in Afghanistan and all of that is, you know, we have to cherish the moments we have and we and we owe it. We owe it to ourselves and those around us to try and make this small community a better place. Totally agree. And 
We're only here for so long. Can we leave a legacy? Can we make an impact? That might be too heavy for some, but the reality check is we can still do do some good and have some fun along the way. Yeah, and to a point, even if it's even if that legacy is on a small group of people around us, that's fantastic because if everybody did that, then the world would be a better place. All right, listen, Mike, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for today. Uh, thank you all for listening and watching, and I will see you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you.